thanks for the um, the great introduction, uh, Melissa. Um, so we are here to tra talk about um, transforming data processing with Kubernetes and um, the journey that Intuit's taking towards building a self-serve um, data mesh um, infrastructure. Um, so we'll be touching upon the the architecture um, and like we'll be going over some of the core aspects of um, data mesh. We'll also be talking about um, how Intuit went about it and some of the components that we have built and we are still building um, and the scale um, of it. Um, so I am Rakesh. Um, I'm a senior staff software engineer um, in the Intuit's um, A2D organization. Um, A2D um, deals with AI analytics and data. Um, I am currently leading the, uh, the batch processing um, segment um, within Intuit. And I have with me um, Janik, who will be co-presenting. Um, and um, Janik is the uh, uh, is leading the data mesh um, uh, implementation uh, for Intuit within data processing as well. I'll flash the agenda um, just for a brief second. We'll be covering these um, in the conversations um, in the presentation today. Um, so before we get into um, uh, the uh, the presentations, I want to give a quick um, uh, I want to touch about like Intuit. So Intuit's uh, uh, one of the core mission is building an AI-driven expert platform. And Intuit's products are powered by uh, five key platform areas, um, which includes the modern dev experience powered uh, by our modern SaaS infrastructure, which is completely built on Kubernetes, uh, which um, enables us to uh, build better AI infrastructure uh, through our um, data, uh, FinTech, and identity. And uh, these are some of the, um, the core um, infrastructure that powers Intuit's product lineups that uh, you guys must be um, familiar with, such as Intuit TurboTax, Credit Karma, QuickBooks, and um, MailChimp. Um, so Intuit uh, believes in open source um, contribution, collaboration. So it, uh, Intuit was a recipient of the end user award, CNCF end user award in 2019 and 2022. And we have also um, created an open source several projects. Um, and we are also user of a lot of cloud native and mobile tech open source. So with that, we'll get into the, um, the first segment of this uh, presentation where we'll be uh, quickly talking about um, uh, what is data mesh, uh, and then we'll be getting into the other segments. So data mesh um, is an architectural pattern that is primarily suited for large data organization um, dealing with um, high volume data uh, and looking for a structure and uh, pattern uh, to manage and improve, of, uh, improve the value of the said data. Um, so it primarily uh, deals with um, uh, data uh, distributed domain driven architecture, which we'll talk uh, more about uh, self-serve platform design and product thinking. So a data mesh uh, is a decentralized data architecture that organizes data by a specific, uh, specific business domain. So what does that um, mean? So usually data uh, falls under um, different um, categories and segments and data mesh um, uh, wants like organizations to uh, think about like um, building um, data from the um, data domain um, and uh, building architecture uh, that um, helps uh, promote this um, structure. So for example, um, data belongs to marketing, uh, sales, customer service, and uh, uh, data mesh wants to provide uh, producers more ownership of um, this uh, uh, data and like, I mean, let them uh, be the data product owners. Um, so typically, uh, in majority of uh, data-driven organizations, um, data is usually a, a byproduct um, uh, of a process uh, rather than uh, data um, uh, being treated as a product. So data mesh also promotes the aspect of uh, building um, uh, your solutions where um, all your um, components uh, uh, attribute data as a product. And um, uh, so that's one of the key themes that we are going to talk about as well. So the reason why Intuit's interested in um, taking um, building data mesh uh, for our infrastructure um, is because like we believe it, it will uh, provide a better smart ex uh, experiences using data. It will improve the value of data, uh, reduce the disc discovery and access uh, taken for um, uh, identifying data and serve variety of um, data personas. Through this, we believe it will power our AI experiences and our AI-driven expert platform mission. Um, so currently, um, this is also enabling our generative AI capabilities like Intuit Assist, which we let, uh, came out with in a very uh, recent announcement. 
So the four core principles like of data mesh uh, or uh, domain driven uh, ownership, which we briefly touched upon, building like your um, architecture where um, uh, data is like treated usually under a domain, uh, building federated uh, data governance and data access. Um, so what that basically means is like building um, principle of least access policies uh, where data uh, access is governed across the organization, um, building self-serve infrastructure uh, for um, promoting like I mean uh, deployment of like data infrastructure and also data mesh uh, and build, treating data as a product which is the product thinking aspect. So we'll get into uh, the next segment which is the data lake and data mesh how uh, we think like these merges together we'll give an example of an, uh, a data product that we have built. So for this example, we are talk, we are going to talk about the um, the small business and uh, QuickBooks. QuickBooks is one of the Intuit products that um, is dealing with um, providing accounting and like invoice solutions uh, for small businesses. Um, so in this example, um, a small business owner has an un unpaid invoice. So the small business small business owner logs into QuickBooks and they realize that like um, they have invoices that aren't um, paid by few um, customers. So the system provides them two options. The system reminds the owner about uh, unpaid invoices and the system also provides an additional feature uh, to automatically send invoice uh, notifications uh, to uh, their customers. So let's take that as the, uh, the uh, business uh, problem that we want to solve for. And uh, so when we break that down into a business technical requirement, so we want to get um, uh, unpaid invoices by business given invoices our data. Um, get unpaid invoices for each customer uh, group by business uh, because we want to identify which customers uh, have not paid their invoices for the business and notify them and build notification capabilities to track and remind business owners uh, and their customers. So given the use case, let's take a step back and like look at like the um, uh, a very um, generic version of uh, a data lake um, architecture. So this is an architecture that would represent like a lot of um, data-driven organizations and how they uh, might be building uh, their, uh, how it's structured today. So it usually consists of an operational data plane. Um, the operational data plane is where your microservices are ho hosted, um, your um, databases, like an in-product in experiences and your app deployments happen. Um, from this uh, operational data plane, there are data pipelines that will be uh, moving your data uh, to um, an analytical um, data plane. Uh, uh, the analytical data plane is uh, usually your data lake, um, and the um, data lake is managed by um, a separate like domain and a separate like uh, uh, part of like the uh, team's organization. And from the data lake, there there is like ML training, like uh, data scientists like interact with the data. Uh, the data goes to a data warehouse. Um, so there's a lot of data use cases that is driven uh, from the data that arrives at the um, data lake. So if you look at the um, the invo for invoice, like how um, the data is aligned in, within Intuit, it follows a very similar pattern. Um, so there is a QBO um, application uh, that um, has its own um, relational database. Um, the QBO application produces invoice data uh, that is like uh, being like uh, written to the uh, data lake, which is the sync uh, using um, the data pipelines. And from the data pipelines, there is further transformation that happens for um, enabling invoice related dashboards, like providing um, customer related like attributes, uh, and then providing like uh, more uh, data analytical uh, uh, experiences. So from this, like um, one of the core aspects we talked about is like taking um, uh, this uh, invoice as our um, data product. Um, so how treating invoice as a data product will um, turn the um, um, uh, management and like usage of like improve the usability and the discoverability um, of invoice. So in this case, like uh, there is the operational uh, uh, user, which is the producer, which is the uh, application, and also the uh, analytical user. Uh, these are data users that utilize the data that arrives in the data lake. Um, so the producer produces the uh, data to an uh, event bus, which is our Kafka infrastructure uh, that gets streamed to uh, the data uh, the data lake, uh, which um, the data that we uh, are, that arrives in data lake we consider as a data product. And uh, from the data that arrives in Data Lake, we can um, do queries um, from the data, like such as like getting the invoice by business, invoice uh, by user and uh, business. So the um, the producer of the app like uh, can like, uh, enable in product experiences, and um, the data that arrives in the Data Lake can enable um, our Gen AI experiences and ML training and other uses uh, that can be uh, had with this data. 
So let's ask some uh, questions um, on this uh, invoice data. So given we've been tasked with this um, uh, specific use case of uh, uh, getting, uh, solving some of the invoices like problem for the business owner, um, as an app developer or as a, uh, as a data persona, um, so you want to understand like, um, how do I find uh, invoice data for my use case? Like, uh, what is, who is the domain expert for this invoice data? Um, how do I find the schema for this invoice data? Uh, where is the data uh, located uh, for consumption? Um, and how can I get access? And um, how, is there any derived data uh, from invoice? Uh, so these are some of the questions we want to build self-serve solutions um, around. And that's what we'll be focusing the remainder of the presentation on. Um, so if you look at the, the way that the data is structured, um, so we call this the data map and like the solution that we have built uh, is what like Janik is going to talk about in the next segment. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. So uh, basically what we have seen up until now is the problem statement that typical data producers are tasked with. And we want to understand uh, how data mesh could make it easier and faster for data producers to tackle the use case and produce data which adheres to certain standards. So that's where we'll introduce the data mesh concepts at into it on how we have taken the traditional uh, or the data mesh architecture and figured out what are the aspects of into it uh, that uh, really needs to be enabled by this architecture. And based on that, we have defined some context, uh, concepts which will essentially answers the, answer the questions that Rakesh just laid out. So let's take a each, each question one by one. Uh, the first one being, how do I find invoice data for my use case? So at a company like Intuit, uh, if you just typically look at uh, data lake uh, exploration on just finding invoice table, it could be created by multiple domains. For example, Intuit could be charging its own customers in, and creating invoices. And Intuit's customer, for example, Q, a QBO company, is charging its own customers and creating invoice. So how do we distinguish these two invoice data? And that is where data map comes into play. So data map is uh, what we are calling it as an organization of data using domain, subdomain, and bounded context. So in this case, the uh, data map architecture or the example you are seeing is uh, small business is the primary domain and QBO is one of the product in small business category. So it is a subdomain and then under that there is commerce, invoicing, and sales subdomains. And finally, invoice workflow is the bounded context. So this is the typical domain-driven design we are applying towards our, uh, organization of data. And under that, a user will find invoice data so they can be confident that this invoice is created for QBO customers, uh, for, their, uh, for the company who is using QBO, and for their customers, rather than a domain like commerce invoicing and sales and invoice workflow, which could be just uh, invoices created for uh, by into it to its own customers. And the next step uh, in this data map is uh, data product, which is the foundational unit of data mesh. Uh, and under each bounded context, uh, we are planning to have data products that are related to each other. Uh, and data products are mainly geared towards uh, consisting essential information that the consumer of data needs. So what does a data product means? Uh, uh, or what do we have as part of data product? Basically, consolidates essential information like uh, uh, the bounded context or the domain under which the data belongs to, what is the data model, SLO, and the primary aspect of like who is the domain expert of that invoice data? How does somebody find that? And that is where we have defined a role called data steward, who is basically an expert in that data domain, uh, comes from the uh, organization or the system that actually produces this data and knows all aspects about that data, that in what use cases you could use this data, how this data is generated, et cetera. And he's also responsible for the contract of that data. And that's where the next question comes into play, like what is the schema of that invoice data? Uh, which basically consists of two aspects, a semantic model, uh, which uh, consists of modeling and schema information that enables data consumers understand what exactly this data is, it could be name of the fields, data types, uh, semantic data types. For example, a field is called string, but actually it is a type of uh, currency or a locate or an address. So it basically maps the traditional data types of a table or a schema to a semantic model. And also it consists of SLAs, 
which could be data quality and data freshness, which consumers care about that, okay, if I'm consuming from this data, it meets this minimum bar. And as a data steward, the steward is responsible to ensure that these SLAs or these commitments are uh, ensured. And from system-wide, we are basically implementing mechanisms so that data stewards can declare SLAs. And as a, the system provides mechanism to measure those SLAs and then provide visibility of those SLAs of whether it is meeting, whether it is standing to the consumers. So that consumer is very confident when they are consuming any data. Right? And the next question is, where is invoice data located for consumption? So we talked about invoice data in the previous architecture slide. Rakesh uh, showed that it could be a data lake table or a Kafka topic. So that is where data ports com come into play. A data product could have more than one data ports or data assets. We call it data assets. And that data asset basically has information about what type of uh, data asset is it, whether it is a Hive table, Kafka topic, it is a Redshift table, or any other type of data assets that we support. And what is the location from where they consume it? And a data asset level, a data steward can also add additional tags for optimal discovery. So for example, a data mart uh, could have tags that basically uh, notifies or basically mentions the business domain it is coming from, the analytical domain it is targeting to support. So that basically makes discovery much easier for data consumers. Uh, and finally, uh, access and governance. So how can I get, so I found the data that I needed. I found what the data looks like. How do I get access to that data? And that is where we are tracking the access for each and every data asset uh, at data asset level. And access is typically approved by the data steward. Uh, and also it is self-managed and self-automated. So user basically finds a data product and data assets through discovery and that itself they can request access for the data. That request goes to the data steward of the data product and they basically see for what purpose that uh, user is requesting access to and it makes sense to give them automatically access or not. So these data mass concepts enable a logical structure like this where a team deploys a data producing system that produces a data asset uh, like a table or stream like uh, invoice and a data steward owns this data asset and creates data product that enca encapsulates this data asset along with other uh, information like data contract and logical model. But now a different team with a use case to consume this data produces derived data and discovers it uh, and then gets access to it, now wants to create a data consuming system and create new data products. So this is where the power of self-serve data mesh architecture comes into play, where we have made all the tools available to make data producers' life easy to make their data discoverable. And now a data consumer wants to consume this and creating a data pro producing system. So that is where our next uh, section about self-serve data processing platform uh, comes into play. So uh, in this section, I basically want to talk about the scope of data processing at Intuit. Uh, and basically we have a variety of users, uh, data engineers who want to write complex CTL jobs or derive enriched data, data scientists and MLAs who write pipelines to generate features or train AI models, and data analysts who build pipelines to power business dashboards. Uh, and the scale, we have more than 2,000 data uh, consumers or data producers at Intuit. Uh, who fall into one of these variety of uh, roles. And we have more than 100K pipelines who process this data from various domains and produce uh, or use one of these uh, uh, flow. So what does self-serve data processing mean for us? Given we have this many variety of use cases, uh, typically user perform these three high level of operations when they are writing or when they're creating a data processing pipeline. Uh, first, they do author and define, where they basically write code, get access to data, uh, define the schedule of job, etc. After that, they provision and deploy. That is when provisioning the infrastructure, deploying the code, and if applicable, uh, registering all the data they are producing in data mesh, creating data product, data assets, providing data contracts that come into play, and also recording end-to-end -end lineage. And then when pipelines are deployed, they want to get alerted in case of any issues and debug uh, to fix and rerun their pipeline. And to solve these kind of use cases and increase the velocity of users to perform actions, uh, we provide different level of architecture abstractions to these user personas. 
And into it, we have built uh, two platforms. One is batch processing platform and stream processing platform. And these platforms are the front-facing applications that the data organization offers to this customer, where they come to uh, create the data pipelines and in inherently uh, these platforms are plugged into the data mesh architecture so that whenever users create data processing pipelines, uh, the data assets are registered, data products are created. These uh, uh, platforms provide the interface for users to do all that. And we'll basically talk briefly about the batch processing architecture. I put it very high level here. Uh, and if we go from bottom up, the runtime where majority of jobs uses Apache Spark for batch, uh, it runs on Kubernetes and infrastructure provides out of the box integration with uh, logging and metrics reporting. Uh, then we have deployment orchestrator and job dependency orchestrator, which basically uh, are responsible for deploying the pipeline and ensuring dependencies are set and met when the jobs run. And then services, la services layer enables pipeline definition, infrastructure provisioning, setting job dependencies, et cetera. Uh, and on top, uh, we have user experience for various personas like UI or GitOps uh, to create and manage their pipelines. And similarly, for stream processing platform, uh, the runtime is again uh, on Kubernetes natively. Uh, and we have uh, majority of streaming jobs done on uh, Flink and few use cases done on Apache Spark. Uh, similar to Batch, we have uh, deployment orchestrator uh, and the additional components for streamings are like checkpoint manager and DR orchestrator, which basically ensures that checkpoints are taken during redeploys and DR orchestrator. We have few use cases which requires disaster recovery and want their streaming pipeline to be available all the time. So DR orchestrator ensures or detects a disaster and then deploys the pipeline to another region if needed. And then API layer is similar to batch, except for streaming, there is no need, need for scheduling. Uh, one other aspect that we have for streaming is processor registry and processor templates. So we have noticed uh, while getting started on streaming to add into it that the time to write a streaming pipeline is usually higher for customers because they are new to the framework or new to the concepts of streaming. And that is where we have created or we are providing processor templates, which basically gives them boilerplate code of a streaming pipeline, as well as for common patterns, we have processor registry where if somebody writes a processor for uh, a specific uh, streaming use case like filtering or aggregation, which is typically re reusable, other users can uh, discover those processors and deploy that as well. And as you may have noticed from the batch and stream processing platform, uh, Kubernetes powers the data processing at Intuit. Uh, Intuit has an MSAS or Intuit Kubernetes service layer, uh, which uh, manages a fleet of Kubernetes cluster and namespaces where our core infrastructure runs. And even the control plane APIs are also deployed on uh, Kubernetes. And we use Argo workflow and events uh, to perform actions or like scheduling orchestration and deployment workflow. So, Given the breadth of this topic, we, have, we are only able to touch the surface of many of these concepts, uh, but we hope this gives you an idea of uh, how we are thinking about data mesh, what problems we are trying to solve using data mesh, and uh, data processing. And if, you, if we have captured your interest, these are some of the resources uh, on data mesh as well as data processing. Uh, our architect has basically laid out in induced data mesh strategy and concepts very detailed uh, uh, description of how we are thinking about implementing data mesh and we are currently just getting started there. So if you are on similar journey, we would love to connect and share our learnings. Any questions? <coughs> awesome talk. Hey, uh, awesome talk. So question on uh, how do you guys surface the data products to your end users. I saw the part about who are your end users, data scientists, data yeah. analysts, et cetera, but uh, is there a UI or some kind of interface yeah. where you yeah. expose yeah. your schemas to your users? So we have uh, a data discovery and exploration portal where all the data products that are registered with the data mesh uh, are basically, so all those products will go to a central metadata registry and discovery uh, basically exposes that metadata registry to users. And that also has like a pretty extensive search. So some of the aspects we talked about tags and other aspects. 
So user could search, uh, and it is also integrated with Intuit Assist, which is Gen AI powered database or Gen AI powered service. The user could just write that I'm interested in voice data, or this is my use case. Uh, what kind of data should I look at? And it will give them options of that these are the data products that exist. And as they browse those data products, they would be able to get to see all the details that we talked about, like schema, SLAs, uh, what is the quality score of this data product, et cetera. Did you build that? Uh, we built it internally. I thank you for the talk. Yeah, I, I have a question about where, I mean, based on your experience, where data normally resides. Uh, where? Data, you know, the actual data. You mentioned about the model, you know, schema, but normally where, where does data reside? Is it in databases Got or it. Uh, S3? So we are basically, not, uh, so typically we had a data lake architecture where the data resided in uh, uh, S3, so Intuit's majority of data architecture is on AWS. So our data lake was based in the S3, but the concepts we described are very generic. So we are expanding the boundary of where data could reside. Currently we are targeting data lake and the event bus architecture or Kafka topics to start with, but we extend it to, uh, we expect it to extend to all other type of hosting locations, we call it at Intuit, where which data, where which host data. So we have customer data cloud, which hosts certain customer related data. We have feature management platform, which hosts all the feature sets. So we, as we expand this journey, we'll try to incorporate more and more hosting locations where data could, would reside. And this, the concepts are defined in such a way, so they are generic to be able to applicable to all of those use cases. Yeah, thanks. Now it's interesting because I graduated many, many years ago in data warehousing. And we are actually trying to, for example, we work with Postgres. We're actually trying to get to the very large database um, kind of use case in Kubernetes. And uh, I think that there's a lot of intersection between what you're mentioning and also the possibility to use um, data, real databases like, for example, Postgres to yeah. perform these queries, yeah. especially now that we are addressing the very large database uh, scenario, not only just to OLTP. So okay, um, so it could be interesting maybe to speak after, you know, and show what we've done and see maybe, you know, how also databases can fit into this data lake and data mesh scenario. So the, um, so the data mesh um, provides an abstraction on yeah. top of like, I mean, um, all these infrastructures. So we have showed an example of an operational data plane and an analytical data plane. And um, so applications that have these, like, I mean, um, uh, relational databases um, can also produce um, the data um, assets, uh, but the, um, the data, like, that also goes to the uh, analytical segment, to the data lake, also belongs to the same um, data, data domain and in the bounded context. So, the, um, so you might be producing the invoice data, in which we're giving an example of, that's stored in your data, database, and then it's also streamed and it goes to a data lake. But the data has and shares the same schema, uh, and like uh, from an end user point of view, you want to show them the lineage that the data starts from a specific um, point, which is the service layer arrives in the database and is also streamed um, to a data lake, and the structure of the data and um, the producers of the data in this example, the um, the the, um, the application uh, or the stewards, they provide the schema, they provide like the uh, the documentations, they drive how the data um, is um, accessed, they are the product owners. In a typical um, service uh, architecture, product owners exist. In data architectures, product owners are not a common theme. So that's one of the main uh, points like that it promotes. Thank you for this presentation, it was excellent. Uh, you gave the example of the invoice, I'm curious, two questions, how many data products already exist? And uh, how many of those are analytical versus operational? Could you have a data product right on Kafka bus for like anomaly detection or something like that? Uh, that's, that's a good question. For the first question, how many data products exist? So before, so right now we are, a journey, we are in a journey where we are implementing this architecture across all data at Intuit. But to test this architecture and its feasibility and its benefits. We started a year or two ago where we started adopting some of the widely used or widely asked data uh, assets and using data mesh concepts. 
So as of today, we have around 900 or so data products in production. And now we are applying these concepts in basically in a year or so where we want to go towards 100% of Intuit's consumable data, which basically other teams want to consume outside of the team that is generating be the presenter as data product. Uh, and the second question, uh, so yeah, I, I missed the second question. Uh, Operational versus analytical. Go ahead. So, the architecture data products could have, as Akash would say, it could have multiple data assets. So the way we are thinking about it is if an operational data asset or a table is streamed towards an analytical space, ideally both of those should live under the same data product and user, a consumer would have option, like if the operational data store is really shareable, then user would, the consumer would choose that, okay, which of that is a, uh, more applicable to that use case and they would want to consume of. Typically, operational data sto stores are not shared outside of the team or outside of the microservices. So we have an outbox architecture where this data that operational data store produces is streamed to, uh, in real time to a Kafka topic and then it is materialized in data lake. So any, uh, and the stream is, is used in feature generation and in product uh, uh, experiences while the analytical data that is replicated in data lake is used for uh, batch processing and analytical use cases. But all those data assets would ideally reside in one data product and user would be able to see that this data is available in, in, to consume in real time in this format. It is able to consume in analytical fashion in this location and format, etc. Feel free to ask questions. We're a very inclusive community. Hi. So just before this question, you talked about um, building abstraction on top of your backends, right? And that's what Data Mesh is doing with your uh, structured metadata. Um, does that imply that you're actually building adapters to a common interface, right? So you can hit Postgres or MySQL or whatever um, through your uh, data mesh service, or is it the data maintainer is providing instruction, providing guidance? Um, at yeah, that it's layer? not really the adapters uh, specifically, but it is more of uh, schema and transform. So typically, semantic model, if the same data uh, resides in analytical table to a topic to a data lake table, its semantic definition would be same across all of them but the structure of it may be different. Like in analytical database, it may be in denormalized uh, tables was when it goes to Kafka, it may be a normalized JSON event and then it is replicated. It may be again a normalized uh, hive table. So the semantic schema remains same. So that is what uh, the metadata would provide to consumer. But then consumer would decide whether they want to use from one or the other, but there is no adapter we are at least thinking as of now. And uh, so the way that we are enabling this across um, into it um, is because um, through the paved path infrastructure. So we have built a paved path where um, service deployments, like pipeline deployments, pipeline management, all of this um, is through um, unified platform infrastructure. So the teams do not like go and deploy their own Kubernetes service layers. They do not like deploy their own data pipelines, batch pipelines. So everything is like going through a paid path infrastructure. So these paid path teams are like I mean centralized teams that um, work with the um, the data organization to build um, the data mesh architecture that we promote and we want the services to uh, adapt. So it's much more streamlined for um, teams to um, integrate rather than like providing them. Um, uh, for example, libraries or like adapters independently uh, because it's a huge organization and it takes a lot of effort to drive it that way. 